I knew that I wanted to be on the product side very early on. So the GC was just my way to build cash flow at the same time, learn the consumer that I'm later going to be serving, which was the best experience that I could have ever uh, done because it allows me now to really understand that mindset. It allows me to understand the day to day, the logistics, the pain points. And uh, that is where early on the need for the network started to happen. So I was almost reverse engineering this entire time. Welcome to episode 114 of the AFT Construction Podcast. I'm your host, Brad Levitt. In this episode, I speak with Tim Roman of Cabinet with a K. And Tim has been a good friend of mine. We met through Instagram many years ago. And he's one of the greatest examples of I know of an entrepreneur. This is someone that was a contractor. He then left and he worked from the supply side, you know, from the kitchen and bath. He's now started his own cabinet manufacturing line. And in this episode, he really dives into B2B, right? As far as business to business, business to consumer, you know, how you set that up. In addition to that, when you're starting to look at investors, how do you formulate, you know, the investors, you know, percentage of company, value, you know, some of us have our Shark Tank and you see those questions happen, but he really dives into it. Just a wealth of knowledge, an amazing company that he started, something that's a great resource for many of us contractors, designers, and architects. So without further ado, let's get started. So welcome to the AT Construction Podcast and very excited. We have one of my good friends on, Tim Roman, visiting us from the Northeast. So welcome, Tim. Hey, thanks so much for having me, Brad. It's been long overdue. This is something Tim and I have wanted to do for a long time and I'll give a little background on how he and I met, but... Tim is the founder and CEO of Cabinet, Cabinet with a K, and he's been a mover and shaker. I'll, I will say, just to preface this podcast, is that you know there's a lot of things you've done, Tim. I really admired. I looked up to. I mean, you have an amazing drive, experience. You've been part of Gary Vee's book. I mean, so you're my name dropper. <laughs> but like the reality is, and I, and I visit you back. I know we spent some time together when I was in Manhattan last time. But you've just done an amazing thing and created an amazing business, and and it's been a pleasure and. You know, you and I met actually through Martin Holsinger's podcast. You know, I think we we're two of the first ones with, uh, you know, on yeah, his yeah. podcast, and and we connected ever since. Absolutely, it's been a ride, man. And I love uh, love watching everything you do. And and you know, I'm a I'm a big fan. I'm front row. <laughs> well, I, well, I appreciate that. I mean, I, to get started here, Tim. So, I it's it's interesting. I look at this from the GC side, and I know you have experience as a GC, which we'll get into in kind of your career here, but. You know, now you're a supplier, right? You're supplying SGCs and you're giving that white glove service and, you know, your business is expanding into now other scopes that we'll get into. But, you know, how's the supply chain been for you as a vendor just trying to meet the demand of us contractors? Oof, I don't think we have the time, uh, uh, given what we just went through over the course of, you know, last year and a half. Um, I mean, everything from every aspect, from the quality, pricing, logistics, uh, lead times, of course, inevitably. Um, but for us as a provider, I think the biggest hit is the sales cycle is doubled now. Um, so the sales transaction has doubled the length of it, which really impacts your cash flow because you're not really, you know, you're not selling t shirts where someone could just kind of pick one up and walk out the store. So your sales cycle is long naturally with a product like kitchens. But when you have delays and shortages, it just doubles, triples, which just totally disrupts your cash flow. So how do you how do you work through that? Because I know for you, you're trying to appease a couple of things. You have your own in-house sales team, I'd imagine. So you have that challenge of them, whether they're commission based or they have seller. I mean, without getting into the complexity there, you have that aspect. Then you're managing your GCs and your demand, you know, on that side, trying to keep them happy. But at the same time, if their project's delayed, now it impacts, you know, you're having to buy this inventory, you're stocking it. So you have holding costs, you know, your storage fees, and then your shipping fees increase. I mean, you may have quoted it at X, but now it's Y because fuel, freight, shipping, handling. I mean, I mean, it's incredibly complex. And so, how are you just working through that? I'm, you know, as as every day gets more complicated. Yeah, I mean, luckily, and I think this was maybe foresight, maybe luck, maybe coincidence, maybe a little bit of both. Uh, when Trump got into office and really started shaking the import export side of things. Um, I saw just nothing but bad things happening um, <laughs> around the corner. <laughs> and I was at that time doing a lot of importing. Uh, we were doing a lot of multi-units and when, when you're doing multi-units, a lot of times it's just closed container stuff. So your, your goal is to have the least amount of hands touch it because that's where the margin dies, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I pivoted early on um, 
before COVID, luckily, and got away from import. So it didn't hit me as hard because I aligned myself with Canadian um, uh, North American, South American companies. So transit times were, were great. Stock was still available. There's no shortage of raw materials. Uh, so it didn't really hit us bad, uh, except for the custom side. You know, the custom side uh, really just slowed down to a screeching halt because on the really high end, you have a lot of third party components. Uh, you have European laminates. You might have some stainless steel that only comes from Italy or, or Spain or Germany or this type of hardware that might only come from Germany. And that part's been, been the most difficult, I think, just the higher end. So how's that, you know, is that still happening? Is that still taking place? I mean, I understand that you're trying to get your footprint on North America because it gives you a little bit more security in the product side, you know, instead of waiting overseas. I know that's impacted us. I mean, some of our homes, we have products coming from Europe. We haven't come from Asia. And so that can create some big conflict, especially where you have containers not arriving. You know, the ports are closed. Yep. They can't get through. So the products may be essentially landed. I mean, it's in the port. It just can't get through the port, which means it can't get on land and can't ship here. And so, you know, how much complexity are you dealing with you know, foreign materials that are so impacting you? Because I know you do a lot of high-end custom stuff being there in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's terrible. You're, you're really finding yourselves kind of fusing different components on the fly together. So if you have a, a really high-end client, one of the benefits of, of having that type of client is their flexibility and obviously the capital behind the transaction. So if you're creative and you have resources, you have a good network behind you, you a lot of times are doing things in the field. You're having a local shop pick up a slack of a factory. Um, I've recently had to have a local shop make, for example, like an island, but the rest of it came from a factory because it just ended up being faster that way. So on the higher end, you're now just like juggling and you're really like a DJ. You're really just doing your best to come up with whatever you're given that day. Um, and it's it's been challenging. But, you know, again, if you have a good network, uh, it's it really just comes down to that. With a good network, you're you're bailed out every single time almost. It is true. It's all about who you know, right? I had a coach in high school that taught me that it's not about what you know, it's who you know. And there's, there's a lot of truth to that, that, you know, being able to pick up that phone and make a phone call, if you've cultivated that relationship, it goes a long way. But for you, Tim, I mean, you're incredibly young. I mean, it's it's amazing just how, you know, the energy you have, the entrepreneurship. And so what's fascinating to me, I mean, for those that are listening that don't know you, you were a contractor. And so you come from my world. Now you're a supplier. I mean, you know, in high school, they said it's not what you know, it's who you know. And so what's fascinating about your story to me is that it's one thing to have built a career as far as, okay, I'm a general contractor. I have my vendors. You know, I'm working through my trade partners, clients, you know, I'm starting to build my resource pool, my network. And for you, I mean, you're incredibly young, ambitious. And so what's amazing is here you are pivoting into the supplier side. So how do you so young, so quickly, so energized now build this network of suppliers, manufacturers, contacts when it's totally foreign? And the reason I say foreign is because you weren't even in this field. It's not like you grew up in the industry as far as, you know, supplying the contractors. You're just going to this cold you know, how does that happen to just build the network where now you can perform for us builders? Um, I think from the beginning, when I got into the industry, as you mentioned, you know, I got into it on the GC side and it was by way of kitchen and bath remodeling. Um, so I wasn't, you know, a really full blown GC. I wasn't really doing like any additions or home builds or anything massive, mainly just kitchen and bath renovations. And that's because a, a really smart man told me that I should really get my feet wet as much as possible when I get into any industry. And I knew that I wanted to be on the product side very early on. So the GC was just my way to build cash flow at the same time, learn the consumer that I'm later going to be serving, which was the best experience that I could have ever uh, done because it allows me now to really understand that mindset. It allows me to understand the day to day, the logistics, the pain points. And uh, that is where early on the like the need for the network started to happen. So I was almost reverse engineering this entire time this moment. Um, so essentially, it's like, you know, this company is six years in the making or seven years in the making, as they say. Um, and I knew that it was just going to be you know, the bigger the network, the better position I'm going to be in. So I started getting on planes early on, going to every single conference I could possibly think of. And I've noticed that a lot of my competition only really kind of just pertains to the, our very immediate domestic market. And sometimes maybe just even in their like neck of, you know, 
states that are combined, right? The Twin Cities or the tri-state area or maybe SoCal, North Cal, uh, Miami. And, you know, people don't really expand. And I started going to Europe, to Canada, to Asia to really try to understand the global market and really try to get a bird's eye view, you know, 30,000 foot view of the situation. And that allowed me to understand that the network is where the power and the leverage is going to be. It's interesting. So, I mean, just that thought of the reverse engineering that here you are, okay, I know I'm going to get into the supply side, you know, but you're going to go into it as a contractor because now you're essentially solving the riddle, right? You're, what are the pain points? How difficult is it being in the field, doing with the client, executing, doing with trade partners, getting installed, getting a finished product, be within budget. I mean, all these things and how important it is to have good vendors, good suppliers that are there behind you because my success as a contractor is dictated by their ability to perform and support me. So by you now going the other angle, how is that giving you an advantage now as you're speaking to contractors because you know what they're dealing with? Yeah, oh, absolutely. It's full transparency. Um, they really feel very open and they don't feel like they have to safeguard a lot of the information that they normally might have to because normally you have a lot of moving parts. You have the client, you have the contractor who might be the installer, there might be a designer involved, there might be uh, an architect involved, and all those things are just really hard to manage. And you know, when we come on board, we speak the language of the contractor. So right away, they kind of put their guard down and they're like, okay, these guys are not here to make my job harder. Um, these guys are really here to kind of help me and guide me through this process. And we're here aligned. Um, our visions and goals are aligned. And it really allows us to kind of have a step up above a lot of our competition because a lot of them are just kind of order takers and they're very one-sided. And it's either like our way or the highway versus with us. It's like we try to adapt to every contractor because we know every build is different. Every client that they're dealing with is different. And that's helpful. Yeah. So what do you, I mean, starting, looking back, you know, hindsight's 2020, 20, of course, you're just starting today. You're, you're going to get away from general contracting and you're going into um, what you're doing now. When you look back, one of the tough things about starting a company, um, and I'll look at it from the contractor side. I know when you're, when I started my company, okay. Well, you have to get credit, right, with all these vendors, but you don't have any, so they want personal guarantees. You know, you don't have any references, referrals, you know, okay, how quick do you pay your vendors, you know, and it's really tough. It's really tough from bonding and everything else. And for you, it's very similar, right? If you're going to represent certain brands in your showroom, they're going to want some track record, some history. And so how did you start building that aspect or at least kicking down the door to be able to supply these products for these manufacturers being a new guy on the block? Um, you have to leverage whatever you have at that moment and play whatever hand that you can. And for us in the beginning, it was marketing. Um, uh, we jumped on Instagram early on. We knew that that's where the attention was. We built up a nice little following and we knew that that is going to be a little bit of leverage in our very outdated, unsocial kind of category. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it's, it, it, you know, if you look back five years, you know, it wasn't like how it is today, right? It was, you know, very few people coming on and the ones that were coming on, they were getting all the attention, all the business, all the referrals. And that was our leverage. We started by, um, looking at smaller companies that would give us chances, uh, because we knew that we couldn't promise buying power right from the get. And then once we established a nice relationship with them, we then took that roster, took those numbers and showed it to the bigger guys and said, hey, look, this is what we've been doing for the last two years. Why don't you now give us a try? And we just keep on doing that, that, you know, until until which is sooner we'll probably get to that. But until we become the manufacturer and then there's no one else to go to. Yeah, because you're you're the one calling the shots at that point. So where does cabinet come in? I mean, you know, we introduced that, you know, CEO and founder. I mean. How does that play a role in what you're doing now? So we're basically a DTC, direct to consumer kitchen and bath cabinetry company. And we ship quality, affordable, modern cabinetry directly to your doorstep without the showroom hassle, markups, and the middleman essentially. So let me ask you this. I mean, this is before getting into just cabinet itself, you know, as the company and that inspiration, what made you start thinking about, okay, it's one thing to have you know, for lack of a better word, the kitchen and bath showroom, right? You know, we have all the plumbing fixtures that's seen right behind you <laughs> here on this video. But yep. what makes you say, okay, let's go after the cabinet sector now? Um, it was, I'm very much a numbers guy. 
I, I love looking at the numbers and they don't lie, as they say. And over the course of, you know, five years, I've tried to dabble in all the different categories, bathroom vanities, kitchen cabinetry, countertops, glass doors, plumbing fixtures, tile, you name it. And cabinetry is, is very good margin. Um, if you can get a great system, um, a great funnel, a great client experience, and you're aligned with a great factory that back that backs that process, um, it's it could be a really really scalable business. Um, and you know, there's only the upside in front of you. And I want to touch upon those in a minute, but I guess my my question to you before getting into you know just building the funnel getting the systems down and all of that, you know, when you start thinking about e-commerce, you're going direct to consumer, which is not, it's not that it's uncommon. It's not the most common either. You know, what, what, what made you think about going the e-commerce route as opposed to maybe a traditional brick and mortar? Uh, I mean, we had, if you just take COVID aside already, e-commerce was just a very booming segment of our lives right and whether it, it's amazon driving things or just everyone like walmart target you home depot you name it these guys are spending astronomical capital into research and development into their digital platforms into the user acquisition costs and their marketing campaigns to really understand the consumer because now they have that ability you know the internet has commoditized their ability to get to their client Whereas before they had to have a national distributor that then had to go to a local distributor. And then that local distributor went to the local market, whether that's the city, town or the county. And historically, that's how our industry was laid out. Now, everyone in the middle, that's why the term is DTC, direct to consumer, from the factory directly to the job site is what's happening. I'm, I'm sure you as a, um, as a builder, you know, are getting probably approached every day by brands directly. Whereas if we rewind back 10 years ago, those would be reps that are reaching out to you. And, you know, they're part of a rep agency that's probably repping numerous different kinds of lines. And that was just the way, you know, our industry was done and ran. Sorry. It's interesting because it is true. And there's still some aspects of the building process that are very similar to that. You know, you have, for, you know, without getting into the details here for the listeners is that, whether you call it a rep agency and they're brokering or they're dealing with four or five different manufacturers. And then you're working with that representative, right? As I'm working through shop drawings and ordering and purchasing and all that stuff from your side, Tim, what's complex to me, because I understand technology and how much this is driving. When you start thinking about Amazon and Walmart and online and how Amazon's really direct to door and how that's completely changed everything. So when you think about cabinetry though, it's one thing to go on and say, Hey, I really want this basketball, you know, instead of going to, to big sporting goods or big five or whatever, I can go on Amazon, get it direct to my door. That's one thing. Cabinetry is very complex, right? It's not, yes. you know, it's not, Hey, I'm going to order, uh, you know, some pop sockets to my house, you know, when you're, when you're <laughs> thinking about a kitchen. So when you start talking about the complexity, the pain points of the direct to consumer, how do you facilitate that transaction, that process being that, cabinetry is very precise and is detailed and if you don't know cabinetry it can be overwhelming yeah um i think you have to when you are thinking e-commerce you know you are automatically eliminating the human factor the touch point the storefront which is the go-to in every scenario whether it's good or bad you know if a client has an answer a question that they want an answer for they were going to go to the showroom they're going to demand that answer they're going to want somebody to you know explain it to them thoroughly and that is kind of the same thing that's happening in e-commerce just in digital way right and in on a digital platform so what you need to do is you need to create a very fluid very frictionless customer experience that mimics the likes of a traditional storefront experience but actually is less friction and more convenient because you're allowing the consumer to do it at their time and in the comfort of their home you know from the comfort of their bed if they want to right if you have a really really robust a platform, it's probably something they could do from their cell phone. And if it's, you know, you, if your user platform and user experience are aligned. So, you know, e-commerce just allows us to take things as complex as kitchens and put them through a rigorous process the same way you would work with your local 
kitchen designer. They would whether they would come out and measure, or you would send the measurements, or maybe <clears throat> someone from your team, uh, maybe the carpenter that is going to be putting those in is going to give you the measurements. And then everything else is usually is done off site anyway. You know, the design, the the samples that are being shown, which now could be shipped to you in a UPS box. You know, renderings, which we now could send you a link. You can click a link and walk through it with your uh, with your iPad or your phone and see exactly what it's going to look like. So, all these technologies and all these components allowed us again to sell these very complex items like you know cabinetry. And uh, I think it's just the beginning. You know, we're there's already you know articles I'm reading about. You know, there's some startups that are good doing this with new home construction, and essentially the similar concept. Um, you're putting a client through a process, and out the other end comes a new home. <laughs> it's incredible. I mean, it's fascinating to me. So when you think about the director, direct to consumer, uh, do you? And and this goes back to your comment about the funnel, right? As you think about the funnel and the sales process, customer acquisition, are you looking more to align yourself, say me as a builder where I'm, Hey, I may do six homes a year and I'm going to go direct to you and, and order six projects. Or are you looking more retail at, you know, John Doe down the street or Sally Jane? Hey, I want this in Miami. I want this in New York. I want this in Missouri. And that they could go on just a normal user, order it, and then figure it out with their own contractor, their own installer. Both. Uh, we're going after both. So those are B2C and B2B. So the B2C is business to consumer. B2B is business to business. And business to consumer, you know, the pros are high margin. Uh, the cons are you're in sales and marketing heavily right. because yeah. you, ha you have to penetrate the, the market. You have to get your, you know, work on getting your client acquisition cost as low as possible. You have to work on your LTV, your lifetime value of the client. You have to make sure your average um, order values are high, your AOVs. And all of a sudden, you're now no longer just like a manufacturer. You're now in like the sales business. business. You're in the marketing yeah. business. Yeah. And on the B2B, you don't have any of that. You essentially are delivering this material to an army, a little army of advocates for you that are going to go out and distribute this wherever they need it, whether it's their end consumers, maybe it's for them. They are the consumer, but they are a business nonetheless. And um, both are equally good. The, the cons there are obviously that there's low margin because it's more of higher volume. Uh, but the pros is that you're not in the sales and marketing business and it's recurring revenue in a lot of cases if you do your job right. And if you're good in uh, when it comes to account management and retention. Um, but we are good at both. So we are going aggressively after both. And the DTC, technically, we can't call ourselves true DTC yet because we are representatives of a factory. But in a short while, we will be, you know, producing our own products. And then we will be a true direct to consumer company as well. Yeah, it makes sense. And and so when I think about that, I mean, really, when you talk about systems internally, it, it, it's complex in this sense, because from a customer service standpoint, or back end support, if you will, it's one thing if you're with a contractor that's doing eight homes a year, 12 homes a year, right? But the one off, there, there will be a little bit more handholding, not just the marketing, not just getting your name out there, not just the sales side. But it's the back end support to help walk them through, you know, and make sure everything's right, are the renderings right, are the measurements. And so that part, I'm, I'm sure, changes just your whole operation internally, too, by working with both different business to business, business B2C as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, B2B is much easier, obviously, from from customer service standpoint. It's a lot more of a relaxed atmosphere because it's peer to peer, right? You guys are mm -hmm. kind of talking the same language. When it's business to consumer, there's a, such a huge level, thick level of formality and, and a lot of legalities in between where it automatically kind of puts a damper on things and it makes it just a lot more challenging. And you have to be heavily invested into your customer service department to make sure that, you know, you're supporting that segment. Um, and, you know, in our case, again, we, we do a, a great job at both, but it's definitely about that funnel. It's about putting them through that system because on our B2C side, we look at it as a, a doctor would or a lawyer would or an accountant would. I don't see or remember a scenario where any of the attorneys that I've worked with just kind of let me ramble on and pick their head and just, you know, just kind of guide their transaction. It was always the other way. You know, I am going through their process on their time, on their terms. And obviously there's some flexibility both ways, but mainly they're driving that transaction because they are the professional, 
professional that I seeked out to help me with said task. Kitchen cabinetry happens to be one of those categories where we should be looked at as professionals, where you're not just coming to us to, to give us an order and deliver some boxes. There is a design process. There is a, an ordering process, which is very cumbersome and very, very difficult. And I think for the most part, clients get it and they just kind of adapt to our funnel. They follow the steps and it's pretty frictionless for the most part. Yeah, it's interesting because I think about it, I mean, without making this too complex, I mean, if you were to go to a big box store without calling them out and you're to order cabinetry, you know, they're not coming in field measuring. You're going to bring in the measurements that they're relying on you. You know, they're going to sit there and you're going to start boxing, you know, the kitchen and put every piece together. You know, if you have any fillers or end panels, I mean, whatever, you know, they're, the design consultant's there. So really, if if you have an online platform now, e-commerce, not brick and mortar, as you're saying, you don't have to have this one-on-one -on -one salesperson that's going to sit there for three hours with the client, they could go in, they could input the measurements and essentially be directed on how they're putting this kitchen together and what's usable for them. Absolutely. Yeah. And then, it, you know, back to your point with the big box stores, their gotcha is, Hey, here's the price. Here's the layout. If you want us to come out and verify this, it's going to cost you under a retainer fee or a measurement fee, what have you. And that's been a standard in our industry, which is helping us a lot because we are slowly implementing that for our clients who sort of throw their hands up and say, you know what, this is a little overwhelming for me. I prefer to have a professional come out. We are now starting to build out a network in every state where we will have a certified professional, if you will, by us, that'll go through our like training program and we'll be working uh, according to our standards, which will allow us to penetrate every state. And if a client raises their hand and says, I need a measure, we send them a $200, $250 you know, invoice and on their way they are. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And so what about you know the install side? Let's say... You know, the, are, are you trying to tackle this element where, hey, Tim, I'm coming to you. I'm coming to cabinet. I'm going to now put together my own custom kitchen. I'm ordering to my house, but I don't have an installer. You know, I'm just, I'm a lawyer. I'm a doctor. Do you point me in that direction? Do you recommend I speak to like a local installer? I mean, how are you bridging that gap? We are, uh, I think because of, for my love uh, for this industry, um, I think it gives me, again, back to what we were talking about earlier, it gives me a really good understanding of that component. And um, unlike other big box stores that hire maybe some in-house teams or maybe set up a satellite office in every state and try to have their own um, installation crews, if you will, we were going to go after and penetrate the best of the best that already exist. So by us having a good brand, we're going to align with other good brands, which are dominant players in their own markets. And then we're going to allow them, we're going to expose them to our clientele. And it's a win-win. We're going to be supporting the local construction industry by doing so, by feeding them the business that we support. We're going to build that two-way relationship with that um, on B2B. And so it's now both. It's twofold. It's B2C and B2B. So I think we have a very strategic approach where we really want to respect the installer industry, the segment, the community, and not come out and say, hey, step aside. We're cabinets going to get this done. No, we, we are here to facilitate a design and to provide a product as efficient, as cost effective as possible, and then to assist the installer as best as possible. Now we're super excited to welcome one of our new sponsors to the podcast, Pella Windows. And this is even more exciting because we use Pella in so many of our projects, nearly all of them. And they've been just an incredible partner of ours. And locally, Sammy and Adam, they are not only amazing business partners behind us, but they are super close friends. And I speak on the podcast all the time about the importance of relationships, right? Relationships with our customers, with our vendors, with our suppliers, because at the end of the day, I'm only as good as those that help our brand and assist us in our projects to, to take it from the ground up all the way to completion. And if we didn't have partners such as Pella, there's no way we'd be who we are today. Over the years, we've built this amazing relationship. When we call them or email them, they respond. They're quick. Their, their company culture, their integrity, their honesty, you know, they are always there to do what's right for us and the customer. They can do anything from small replacement projects to large custom homes and even multi-million dollar commercial projects. And also, when you think about their product line, they can do ultra contemporary, historical preservation, and large traditional projects. So for anyone, any scale, any size, they're the ones to call. They're here local. You know, they have an amazing Instagram. Make sure and give them a follow to see what they're doing. So if you need windows and doors, give Sammy and Adam a call. We stand behind Pella. We love what they do, their culture, their brand, and especially their quality. 
And if you want to learn more about Pellet Windows, check our show notes. We'll have everything tagged there so you can give them a follow and have their contact information to reach out. And now let's get back into the episode. It's amazing. I mean, as you're speaking through this, I, in my head, I'm just thinking of the complexity of what you're doing here. And it's it's amazing. Like, it's incredible, the ambition behind it, um, to, to understand it at this level. I mean, Tim, we're... When you, when you think back about, I, I know for you, you're super ambitious and you're going to attend trade shows and you're amazing at, you know, at, at networking and, and resourcing, but the amount of information to understand how business operates, to understand what channel do I need to sell to? How do I want to market this? How do I build my installer base? How do I build my B2B, my B2C, right? I mean, all these different channels. Is this just learning on the fly? Was was there's someone that you look up to that was a mentor to you. I mean, where does that come from now to be where you are today? Oh, uh, no, no. It's obsessiveness with perfection. Um, it's just, I am, I have a rule that every day, if I don't learn something, it's a fail day. Um, and I literally, if it's 10 o'clock and I feel like I didn't really learn anything, I will pop open the book that I'm currently reading, make sure I get like 10, 15 pages in and shortly I'll highlight something that'll get me thinking about something. And the more I do of that, the more I realize that the next time I have some free time for my brain dump sessions, that's when these great ideas and systems and thoughts come out. And I wonder where they come from, <laughs> you know? So it's, I wish I could say, you know, it's intuition or a mentor. It's not, it's just really um, following what already works, you know, a lot of emulating and mainly applying and testing my creative that I think should be maybe we should try this and maybe we should try that. Um, and I think that's the only variable that is uh, probably the component that keeps it exciting for us because other than that, we're just selling cabinets, right? To, to, to call a spade a spade. Uh, but the fact that we're willing to jump on a plane and maybe find some cool manufacturer that is introducing a, for the first time ever, a waterproof cabinet or something, we're down. You know, so that's what, uh, that's what we're about. <laughs> I love it. And so let me, what keeps you up at night as you start thinking about the risk, right? Now here you are getting into cabinet, right? And, you know, when you start thinking about going back to this, the field measure, the liability, the risk, if a measurement's off, you know, how, how are you managing that aspect? And in addition to that, what is it that's keeping you up at night, especially as with a new business venture? Yeah. Uh, as far as the measurements, again, it's been really good. Uh, we call this process squeezing and suffocating the gray area. Um, <laughs> we will literally exhaust our clients until they understand how important it is to get these measurements right. Because there's a reason why people say measure twice and cut once. Um, and for kitchens, it couldn't be any truer. So we have a very strict process where we do not take a deposit unless we have your appliance specs, unless we know how big your windows are, your trim sizes, your finished floor heights. And even then, we then do a little bit of educating and let our clients know like, hey, we are the experienced professionals here. We know you told us a 96 inch ceiling and you said you're putting down tile. Historically, we know it's almost impossible to guarantee the height at this moment because you're doing a renovation. There's might be level discrepancies. There might be all these things. So we have all those as a part of the funnel and we kind of check them off as we go. Because again, back to when I did this on the installation side, I remember all these pain points and they really are repetitive. There's only so many, you know, um, you know, trip ups that you can have, right? The ceiling height is wrong, the trims, the windows, the door openings, maybe door swings, appliance sizes, the rest of it is normally maybe something damaged or different color. And that's already sales error and delivery error. But like straight, you know, technical, I think we have it down packed so well where it's literally just going through with check boxes and our clients are like, oh yeah, let me find out for my installer how big this trim is gonna be. I'm glad you asked. Oh yeah, I didn't realize, you know, my window is this wide and this is, so we really take our time. And unlike our competitors who are mainly after just transacting and order taking, and most of our competitors are actually half checkout, you know, carts where you can put the cabinets in a checkout and literally, you know, hit proceed to cart, check out, and these cabinets are going to arrive. We will never release that option. Uh, because we feel like it's not something that a regular consumer is ever going to be able to do successfully. Um, so we will always scale with that in mind. I love that you shared that. And I, I think there's a valuable lesson here for anyone listening. And whether from your side, from the manufacturer side, Tim, you know, the vendor side, even as a builder, you know, I think back, I was doing uh, before college 
some ecclesiastical work down in Argentina, and there was a, a, a my mentor of mine down in Argentina. He he was a pilot, right? And he said, and this this gets back. He also, in addition to being a pilot, he owned a, a company that built pools all throughout the Western U.S. You know, big commercial pools and spas, and uh, and and he loved on the side. He would do woodwork, right? So in his shop, he always, he had the sign. He said, "Is today the day I cut off my finger?" And he, and the reason he had that, he said, "Look, as a pilot." I have a checklist. When I sit in the cockpit, right, that I go through this checklist, checklist and, and 20 items, and I'm going to check all 20. And every pilot does this, and they make sure that everything's up and running because not only is the safety of their life, but also maybe their passengers if they're flying commercially. So this checklist is super key because this will uh, essentially s- secure their safety on that flight. And he said business is no different. You think about you, Tim, as, you know, when you're thinking about your SOP as a company, what is my operating procedure, my standard operating procedure? What am I doing? What's my checklist? When does everyone on, on, on the chain from me down to my superintendent, do they understand protocol? Do they understand how to handle this? What's yeah. my checklist so that every day I know I'm not going to lose my finger, right? And you think about for you, Tim, what's fascinating is here you are now that you have a checklist. You say, okay, look, what's your window size? What's the trim size? What is the floor height? You know, the finished floor height. What is the appliance specs? I mean, doing this enough, if you have this checklist, you can now check and secure and make sure that when a client's putting this order, we've gone through ABCDE, we're ready to go, and it's going to minimize our risk and uh, any issues we may have. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that's exactly, you hit it right on the nail. And, you know, it's it's very much just like flying a plane, you know, having systems. And the part that I only didn't get to touch on is that's not the part that keeps me up at night, surprisingly. Um, <laughs> it's not, uh, I was going to say, because that's like one of the biggest risks you're dealing with, right, is making sure, absolutely. hey, when this ship's out, is it, is it going to be right? Yeah, no, my, my biggest, uh, uh, my biggest part right now that keeps me up at night is the fact that we are, um, taking on funding and, um, you know, we're raising our seed round. Um, and it's something that I have never experienced before. It's a level of pressure I have never experienced before. And I thought that being a small business owner is, is pretty, uh, it's pretty hard enough. <laughs> uh, but when you take outside capital, you know, funny thing happens. Um, you start answering not only to yourself, but to other people and your due diligence gets better and faster and more precise. And you're, you become a lot more systematic. You have to be more analytical. You're forced to look at numbers and it really, you know, it forces you to be a better businessman. So that's the part that keeps me up at night because I'm now con- constantly feeling like there's this Olympics that's about to go on and I'm not ready and I have to keep exercising and exercising. And the Olympics is probably going to be our series a round. If you know, God willingly, we ever get there. Um, that's going to be the point where, you know, the investors convert and it's a big deal. And, you know, that could be the defining moment of the next, you know, 20, 30, 40 years of my life. And I think that's the part that's more overwhelming, surprisingly than the complexity of our business. No, I I can appreciate that. I think as a business owner, which you are, Tim, I mean, I look at it this way. I mean, just to relate it without the investor side, I mean, I have people, right, that work for me. They have families, they have kids, they have spouses, they have a livelihood, right? And so part of the stress of an entrepreneur and business owner, which is what keeps me up at night is, do I have the the funnel? Do I have the leads? Do I have the forecast? Are, are, Are we hitting cash flow? Do we have people paying? Are we billing properly? You know, all these things come into play to make sure that that check is there at the end of the day so that they can support their family and they work hard and it keeps me up. And then when you think about not only do you have that, but now you have the investor side. So yep. they're investing money and capital to help you build your dream and be a part of that. How, how engaged are they? How involved are they with the business? Are they, you know, saying, Tim, run with it. We trust you. Here we go. You know, have they been a resource? How does that work? Just that whole communication dynamic with, with the funding side? Yeah, I mean, I think we're, we're, I'm a bit far away from bringing on hands on um, investors, I feel like I have enough know how and I know my industry well enough to really drive this for the next couple of years, at least. Um, And to really, you know, I still have phases of this business post funding that, you know, we could do another podcast about um, that just so many good ideas and plans for how to scale this. But, you know, there, there's only one that's involved because he is the CTO. Um, he happens to be, uh, he had a bunch of exits in the tech space and it happens to be that he's a friend of a friend and he came in <clears throat> as a CTO and he has a seat on the board now and he is, you know, essentially a heavy decision maker and we very much 
um, depend on him for that side now, because now as a CEO, you know, it's not, I'm no longer just the president and the owner. I have other chief officers that technically have to answer to me and we have to work together. And, you know, CTO is a, is a very, very challenging role in e-commerce because you're like the CEO, you're, you're, you're the heart of this whole operation because you're the guy that makes sure the website turns on every morning and, you know, the flow is, is there and the marketing channels are performing and the analytics are, are hooked up and that the back end is performing just as well and the customer service end is connected. So there's this huge technical component that, um, that I'm not really involved in, which is nice, um, but I do understand enough to um, you know, deal with it from afar. And that's probably been the most challenging, but all the other investors are very much hands off. Uh, this, I'm just an investment, a investment in part of their portfolio. So that makes it, uh, makes it a little bit easier and less pressure that way. I, I, I love that. And as you were speaking, it reminded me, so my professor in college, when I was doing construction management, he, he had a very successful commercial firm and he had talked about, he had opened a bank, right? And so he opened a bank and it ended up grew. He opened a couple of banks. He was kind of in a couple of different fields. And he said, when he was making his first hire, he had to bring on an executive, you know, a CFO that's going to help him run the bank and the lending and, you know, the, the credit union. And he said, it was funny because when he was interviewing uh, the guy who was going to hire, he asked him, he said, you know, don't give me a salary. I just want to collect late payment fees from all the consumer base. And so my professor's like, what? He's like, that's it. He's all, that's all you want for payment. Like, sign me up. Like I've never missed a payment. And he didn't realize like how many people miss payments and really where I'm getting at, he said, you know, luckily this guy was, was really great. And you know, he had some skin in the game and came in at a discounted rate. And I'm not sitting here to ask you, Tim, how's this operation work, but you have to find people that believe in you as you're looking at a, a good CTO. I mean, he has to build the framework. He has to make sure that all the technology is running properly, right? As you mentioned, the website, the marketing. So from that side, I mean, he has to be vested. He has to believe in you. He has to believe in the company, believe in the process, whether, Again, not to get the specifics, whether he's taking a salary now or he's taking a percentage of the company, he's going to help build it. So he's looking at the end goal, not just yep. the day-to-day. -day. And so th these conversations happen. I mean, how, especially going back to the experience side, how do you even come to negotiating table, going back to the example of my professor, to say, okay, well, what's fair? Are you leaning on him to say, Here, here's what I want, here's my nut to crack, and then here's a percentage because I'm, I'm in this, I'm with you, we're partnering together? Yeah, I mean, luckily for me, um, I had a little bit of leverage when I was doing the pitches. And the biggest part was the fact that I've already done this. You know, this is not a startup that is heading into the unknown territory. I have a successful track record. You know, we have probably over the last five years, close to six to seven million dollars of sales and products. And Amazing. that's that speaks volumes. And I think investors are not stupid. They also follow money. Um, there have a lot little, uh, very little emotion in this in this game of investing. And they understood right away that this, you know, this guy's really passionate about the subject. He's really looking to shake things up. Uh, we like the message. We like the jockey. We like the horse. We like the the industry. We like the sector. And it just kind of all stars aligned. Uh, but we're doing something a little bit different. So instead of a uh, uh, traditionally, when you raise, uh, normally you would do a convertible note. Um, you know, we won't get into that. People can Google what it is. Basically, it is think of it as a loan. You know, investors give you money that has a maturity date. So that loan will definitely expire at a predetermined date. That loan has interest and, you know, you agree on a, on a term or whatever. Now, that's traditionally how it's done. Um, normally, uh, when you do these, you know, you kind of have to put a value on your company immediately. And that's very challenging early on when you're not sure what it is that you're going to be in three to four years. And, you know, you don't want to value it too low. So investors take your lunch money. You don't want to value it too high. So investors feel like they have too little skin in the game. So there's this new instrument, financial instrument, uh, that's called safe notes. And what that does is it allows you to set aside the, the value cap value, um, of your company. And it allows you to tell the investors essentially, Hey, when we go for our conversion, when we get to series a, we are going to limit your investment at a value cap. So we are going to pretend 
that you are making this investment on a $5 million valuation cap. So next time when the new investors come in and the company's being valued at 10, 15, 20 million, your investment will not get diluted like it normally would via convertible. So there's more upside for them at the same time as there's more risk because it's not a loan anymore, right? So that's what we're doing. So that allows the investors to essentially get more creative they have first money in rights, which means that every time we're going to raise, they automatically get uh, the first opportunity to to uh, participate in the in the next round. And surprisingly, this is a very common way of doing things now, and uh, it's been very easy. It's surprisingly easy. I mean, the term sheets are no bigger than this paper, you know, literally, um, and it's just short of a handshake deal you know it's 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 very common when you're dealing with investors that are actually day-to-day -day investors it's surprisingly easy from what i understood in these last six months is the money is actually not the hard part um getting the funding especially today in the united states with capital being so cheap that's not the hard part you know the hard part is getting people that actually understand um your goal and you obviously should be doing a good job at explaining it at the same time I love to get that breakdown, Tim, because I think what's valuable for those listening is that when you're thinking about as an investor side, as you mentioned, you have the traditional, well, not traditional, but you have the loan option or this where they can invest money that's really it's at risk, right, for them, but they're going to have a small ownership, whatever that may be. And then first right of refusal, explain that. So what ends up happening is just an example, say your value in your stock or your company at a hundred grand. Well, now you're performing, valuation's up, you know, you're going to increase your, maybe your company's worth 2 million now from hundred K. Well, now you need a cash call. You maybe need 500 grand cash call for open a warehouse, open a distribution line. I mean, add people, overhead, sell, whatever it may be. And that's where these investors who are in the original, they have the first option, right, to come in on that term sheet. They have the first right of refusal to say, okay, you need 500K cash. If I'm a 10% owner, I need to give you 50K, and then I keep my, my ownership essentially. Exactly. And that mar and that va valuation cap allows them to not get diluted, which is the most important part. That mm -hmm. is the the caveat and the, the golden egg. Right. Because they don't want their ownership or value to be diluted. And But the reality is if they don't want it to be diluted, they still have to step up, right? They have to bring cash exactly. to the table because you're growing and expanding. So they're going to continue forward and be, be a partner with Tim all the way through the get-go. Or through the yeah, end. it's 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 a healthy two-way relationship versus with the the traditional route, the convertible note. It's a lot more pressure, and there's constantly fallouts because when the loan expires, it's always last minute. Founders are scrambling to pay, you know, payroll, yeah, pay it and off, yeah. it, it's it's tough. Yeah, and normally a lot of startups failed because of that, because of poor financial planning, not because it was a bad idea or a bad product or service. Well, what's tough? I mean, without getting into the complexity of you know pro formas and and balance sheets and everything. I mean, think as you're buying product, as you're buying, as you have inventory, right? As you have equipment, managing depreciation, the company could be really valuable, but cash on hand's one thing. You may, you know, like they say, you could be uh, land rich, but cash poor, right? I mean, it's, yep. <laughs> you, you have to understand that. And so there is a complexity. If it is a loan and the payments do well, you may be really healthy as a company because you're building for the future, but you may not have that cash in the bank that you can leverage. It's just liquid at the moment. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. You hit it right on the nail. So, Tim, from that side, I mean, would you, when you look at this, you know, what? Why do you feel Cabinet has such an advantage over your competition? Um, mainly, I think because we know two things and we do them really well, which is kitchen cabinetry and customer service. Um, and in e-commerce, customer service is everything. And unlike our competitors, we are not order takers. We are we live, eat, and breathe kitchens. So when our clients are interacting with our designers, they are in fact talking to a designer, a kitchen designer, whether it's an uh, an associate designer or a senior designer. Um, it's still a designer, and it's someone who is very much passionate about what they do. Uh, they smile when they come into work, and that's just the, the 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 structure that we like to keep. And I think that you can feel it when you pick up the phone and, and speak to our brand. And most importantly is just our swag. I mean, we're bringing <laughs> <laughs> we're bringing Flatiron to Main Street America, making it accessible and affordable. Now, for anyone that's never met Tim, this guy has he's a, a I mean, he has some class. Trust me. And, <laughs> You know, when, when my wife and I were in Manhattan, he took us around. And, and what's amazing to me is how you're building this, 
you know, it, just where you're at and, you know, the complexity. And I think there, there's a lot of value, you know, having to build in the city. How, how did having to build in Manhattan, how did have, you know, supplying product in Manhattan? It's a very congested, you know, whether it be tourism, whether it be just business and operations. I mean, it's a very complex city to build. And every time I'm in New York, I'm like, how do people build here? I just don't get it. I can barely get my guys to show up and do, you know, in Arizona where they got plenty of room to stage and put equipment and park and you don't have any of that. Yeah, it, it's tough. It, the name of the game is logistics. You have to be extremely organized. Um, you have to really value your time and everyone else's time and you have to over communicate. You know, I probably have three text chains on every project and that's because one might be with the installer. The other one might be with the doorman that's coordinating the delivery and holding the service entrance for us. The third one might be with the management company who we have to send the certificate of insurance from the shipping company in order for them to legally step foot on premise. Right. And then the, the last one might be the plumber who's now like, hey, guys, no one sent me the plans. Can someone please loop me in? And then, you know, we just do it over and over and over. And you have to scale with that in mind. You can't like have a virtual assistant take that over. You can't have a CRM system take that over. It's New York City. You just get ran over, you know, and the it's it's very fast. It's very brutal. You know, a lot of management and a little bit of bribing gets you far. In New York City. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's no doubt. And, and <laughs> the, the reality, there's some truth to that. I mean, you have to take care of the bellman or, you know, who's oh, running the elevator. Yeah. Make sure you watch my truck that it doesn't walk off or all my product. But, uh, you, you know, there's some truth to that, unfortunately. But you, and, and when you dress nice like you, Tim, it makes it easy. <laughs> so what what I love about just getting back to the customer service side, when you talk about the advantage you have at cabinet or the competition is, you know, I typically, especially now, a lot of our projects are working with custom vendors, right? Custom cabinet firms that are building everything and field measuring. They're kind of running that. But uh, I do have many projects and I have had a lot of projects in the past where I'm ordering uh, maybe similar to you, like an e-commerce, right? Where I'm doing the takeoff, I'm doing the ordering, and my challenge has always been that anyone I've worked with, and I'm not going to call them out by name to throw them under the bus, is that, that going back to your checklist, they never ask about appliances. And when I try to give them appliance specs and work through this, like they're like, no, this is on you. You need to figure it out. And, and it's so tough because people don't realize with, with appliances what a key role, especially with built-ins, you know, when you're looking at the reveal and, it, you know, do I have a cabinet panel on the appliance? Is that, am I just going to have the stainless steel front? Where does, especially with built-in, where does the plumbing go? Where does the electrical go? I mean, it's so precise. And for you to really take that, where you have a designer that's looking at this, I mean, I can I can tell you from my personal experience, if I had cabinet around at the time, you know, this is a slam dunk no-brainer to have someone that's going to actually go through the appliances with me to make sure it's right. Yeah, absolutely. And and like you said, it's really, really intricate in a lot of these cases. And these these appliance manufacturers are not stopping anytime soon. Mm -hmm. You know, they're working tirelessly to create sleeker, better you know, appliances that are more integrated than ever and kitchens become the extension of your dining room. So gone are the days where they look like appliances. They look like cabinetry in a lot of cases now, which is what the consumer prefers. And, you know, it's funny you mentioned that we did a very um, interesting study, research study, where we did a little secret shopping and we were just curious. We sent 10 competitors, the same napkin sketch, if you will, and on purpose, we put a refrigerator right up against the wall. Not a single one of them told us that regardless of what refrigerator you're going to be using, there is absolutely no way, <laughs> unless, it's, unless it's hinged specifically, that mm -hmm. it will open fully and your interior little rollout right. will, ne will never come out. That's a thing. <laughs> See, and that's what I mean. It's that stuff that most consumers would understand. They're thinking, okay, when I lay out my kitchen, I want to think tight. I want the refrigerator here in the corner. But they don't understand if this slides against the wall, I can't open my door fully. And because, you know, I can't pull up my drawers. And so none of these cabinet companies even caught that or even mentioned anything to you. And the worst part about it, Brad, is the fact that these same appliance companies work just as hard to create the spec sheets and installation manuals. And it's spelled out there black on white without looking too hard for it. It usually tells you this how many inches you need it away from this side, from that side. And it's all right there. All you need is the spec, five extra minutes for your team that's properly trained to go through that checklist. And you've picked up so much value for the consumer, you know, just by following an SOP. It's amazing. And so I'm, I'm sure from your side, especially customer services, you're catching this stuff and actually, hey, FYI, we need to do X, Y, and Z, whether put a filler or whether we space this and whatever it may be. I mean, you're going to help them out with that, 
with that entire design, which is huge. So when you're looking at the kitchen itself, is there a certain aesthetic? You know, when you look at cabinet, are you are you catering to traditional, to modern, transitional? Is there a certain demographic you're pursuing? Yeah, our specialty is definitely modern based on where we are positioned and just our experience and our portfolio. But we are not going to kid ourselves and we're not going to fight the market because 80% of the United States is still very much a transitional, traditional market. Um, because the 20% that's modern, that is really just the metro cities. Mm -hmm. That is right. the New York, the LA's, the Miami's, the Boston's, the Seattle's, uh, you know, um, you know, Scottsdale, right? right? Like yep. a lot of the, you know, Austin. Uh, so it's coming. So we're positioned for the, for the shift because it's definitely coming because the strongest buying demographic has now all the capital and all the decisions, which are the millennials and they are travelers, they are modern, they are European design driven. And that's going to drag the modern design into the suburbs deeper and deeper. I see you doing tons of modern stuff where I'm sure 10 years ago, it was not like that. Totally. It was corbels and cherries yeah. and, and roosters and a backsplash. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's just, you know, this, it's this design. You can't stop it. And it's like art. I don't know who said it, but art, you know, it never stops, right? It's just always evolving. And same thing with, uh, with cabinetry. So we're positioned to handle our traditional transitional, but really as a modern specialist, because we feel like that's a huge segment that's going to be up for grabs and no one's really – um, addressing it properly. Because if you think about it, you know, if you look on cabinet on our website, we have three tiers of cabinetry. And in every single tier, there is a modern door style, which is sometimes just simply not available in some areas. I, I, we had a client call us from somewhere outside of Vail, Colorado. It was one of our first orders. And the gentleman simply said, I cannot get this look anywhere around here. Everyone's got the shakers and the cherries and the stains and I can't get it. And on top of that, this guy travels to Europe a lot. He's in finance and he has offices in Germany. And he specifically said, oh, you know, I like the aluminum drawers. I don't like the wooden drawers. Could you guys do that? Absolutely. Could you still keep it plywood? Absolutely. Because that's more common to the United States than the right. European MDF. So we're positioned as a, as a very strong hybrid, but um, definitely people I think are gonna come to know us for our, our, the strength on our modern side. Well, and let's not kid ourselves. I mean, going back to just the complexity of doing a good design and the advice and, and reveals, I mean, modern designs are very tough to execute. They're so precise. And, you know, even for our clients, we're doing a lot of modern right now. And even from the builder side, I mean, the craftsmanship, it's totally different. It's completely different and yeah. and, and it's very precise and you have to be right. And, and I love that you're doing the aluminum interiors, you know, and, you know, the walnut. I mean, whatever it may be. I mean, it's very common, right? The different functions. And so for a client coming through, the online portal, they do have these options, right? If they want the aluminum yep. interior, if they want the walnut interior, you know, that nice rich wood and those tight lines. I mean, essentially, and it's funny because I do have clients even now where in a transitional home, they're still doing these really sleek flat panel cabinetry, right? That's, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's unconventional from what we saw a lot of in the past. Yeah, yeah, definitely. No, I feel like it, it's going to definitely penetrate a little bit more and more, especially with Gen Z getting a little bit uh, more financially equipped. We're going to have a ton of crypto millionaires any day now. <laughs> right. um, you know, there's just so Crazy. many, you know, there's just so much, you know, we're a really healthy economy in a lot of ways. In a lot of ways, we're not, but in a lot of ways, we are. And that's one of the ways is that I feel like, you know, the, the buying power today lays in the hands of a consumer that is pretty financially educated versus the previous generations. I think they're a little bit smarter. Um, they're, 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 maybe not as smarter with saving, but they're a little more smarter with investing, which allows them to maybe, you know, establish a little bit of a compounding interest effect. Yeah, it's amazing. So do you miss contracting at all? No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> I know you not do. But you have to tell me because you had quite the experience. Didn't you have a, a, a fun ice oh. maker incident? Oh, yes. Don't, oh, man. This is, this is a PTSD. Full is, it too, right is, now. It, is it too early? I mean, it's been a few it's years. Too, too soon. You got holidays around the corner. It's going to take me months to get over this. <laughs> no, I feel you. You know, it's funny because the complexity, I mean, being a general contractor, and, and, and I do appreciate at least social media, you know, where I get to meet uh, friends such as yourself, Tim, because we can commiserate together. And, and I know I have clients that listen to this, and, it, and I don't mean it in a disparaging way. It's just, you know, it, and going back to it, when I sit down from the business development arm, clients come in and they're like, hey, Brad, you know, you're doing these amazing projects. Like, is my house not good enough? Is it not expensive enough or it's too small? And I'm like, no, look, 
I'll be realistic. I don't care what you're spending. I just want to work for good people because construction is a really tough industry. And, you know, you think you may have had a handle on it in 2018 and then here comes 2021 and it's a complete nightmare. I mean, it's just, it is what it is. Like, I mean, it's like I, delays, time frames, product, I mean, trades, you know, labor, I mean, whatever problem you can think of, like we're dealing with it and it's, and it's daily, but you know, it is a complex business and, and we are grateful for the vendors we have on our side, such as you, Tim, especially to understand the pain we deal with. Oh yeah. I applaud you guys. <laughs> well, I, and I love how serious you are or, uh, straightforward that, yeah, I don't miss it. So, uh, nope. you know, and, and you've been super, uh, generous with your time today, Tim. So, you know, what, looking back at your career though, I mean, what do you feel the best advice or made the best learning experience you've had just in building your company? Um, uh, let's, let's see if I can get a few, uh, biggest one when it comes to the, um, I would, okay. I would say this, uh, you have to really know how to understand the market that you are getting into. And what I mean by that is we might think that we have a great idea, a great product, a great service, a great color for our t-shirt or our logo or whatever. But ultimately, it's the market that you are going to present that to that it's going to decide whether it's good or bad, whether the price is low or high. So the name of the game, especially early on, is test, test, test. And the market is the market is the market. Um, on top of that, you can never stop. If there is traction or no traction, if you thoroughly believe you did your due diligence and this is a good idea and a good product, and even if you just had one sale, that's enough to keep going and never stop until you're probably physically can. Maybe that's the only time I would give up um, on an idea that I truly passionately uh, believe and stand behind. So I think those two combined can get you very far because everything else has been really commoditized when it comes to business and entrepreneurship. You know, when when I started thinking about entrepreneurship, that was the times where it, it, it you know, it was like not the thing, you know, you, you had to be part of some sort of a system where it was the educational system or maybe the technical system, you know, being a contractor or you're going to a vocational school or a technical school. So, you know, anyone who started a business was normally, you know, wasn't looked at the brightest bulb in the, in the box. And today <laughs> it's different because yeah. it's, it's, it's accessible, it's available, it's open. There's so many platforms that support it. Internet has commoditized information. So, so yes, a business degree is a, is a wonderful thing. And the networking that you would get in college is invaluable. But if you don't have the means and if you don't have the resources and if you don't have the time to go that route, I promise you, you probably could get very close through other digital resources um, if you have the will. And I think that's the biggest advice that I had that I now give to others uh, when there's a chance. Yeah, I, there, there's a couple of points there, Tim. I mean, I had Jeff Eccles on the podcast a while back and a lot of the conversation was you have to understand your ideal client, right? And if you don't understand your ideal client, then you really have no reason to be in business because you have to understand. And that's really what you said, understand the market, like know who yep. you're selling to and understand what makes that person up. Like what, you know, where have my projects been successful? Where's my customer base been successful and then target that. And then, as you mentioned, I mean, hard work, it's easy to sit here and say, man, Tim, like he's done X, Y, Z, but they don't realize the nights you've been up, you know, the research you've done, you know, the grind. Right. And, you know, social media has so many benefits, but in one way it cheats us a little bit to look at other people and not realize the climb it took to get there. And, and, and unfortunately they're not unfortunately, but the real, the real, the realism behind this is it takes a lot of work. There's, you know, oh, yeah. it, it doesn't just happen and there's a lot of drive. There's a lot of risk and that goes into the life of an entrepreneur. So, um, again, Tim, you've been amazing. So for a cabinet, you know, what, what's upcoming and exciting now with the new launch of cabinet? Uh, the most exciting part is we have a couple of programs uh, that I mentioned. One of them is the the installer measure network where we'll have someone in, in every state. But also we're excited to team up with uh, some brands that I'm sure you're very familiar with. Cambria, Caesar Stone, Sile Stone. And we're going to try to work very hard to open a network of fabricators in every state, which will allow us to package our kitchens down to the countertop sink and faucet and backsplash. Um, so essentially, at that point, we're going to be packaging this product, making it even more easier for our consumer where they have to spend less time sourcing these things elsewhere by way of aligning ourselves with the likes of Kohler's and Saks, you know, the big brands are leveraging them. We're not going to ever be going into manufacturing or creating our own products outside of cabinetry. 
Uh, but the biggest thing that we're very excited about is post-funding. Uh, when we uh, roll out this next phase, uh, we are going to deploy a lot of capital into a designer program. And the thing that really uh, dawned on me not so long ago is that interior design is really not accessible to the average consumer in America. And after doing some homework, I've realized that it's something something like 5 to 10% of Americans will ever have the means or the opportunity to work with an interior designer. And at that, it might not even be a really good interior designer because they might not be in the cities that we mentioned earlier. Um, Cause that's just, you know, let's just call it a spade a spade. That's where all the, the, that's where the diamonds are made. Um, and we're going to be partnering up with celebrity star, a level um, designers. We are going to be, they are going to be coming on board and packaging our materials into think mood boards which will allow clients to easily come onto our site and say i like the vanessa de leon design or i like the farah inspire me decor design or i like the you know hey did you know that kitchens of insta has their own little mood board and cabinet that they put together so it's them leveraging our materials uh it's a two-way relationship because we will have a revenue model available now for our designers whoever has a virtual design service you know, they can introduce that to the client, but we will essentially be a middleman for a very minor fee for this package. And every time this package is pur purchased, 100% of the proceeds are going to go to the designer. That is amazing. I mean, that is so creative. I, I, I've, I've spoken with a lot of people that do a lot of interesting, you know, I, I, I should say just targets, right? As far as what they're advertising and options and, and, and different product. It's amazing. I mean, it's fascinating that you're, you know, that you're working out these designers and it just makes it, uh, easy for the consumer, makes it great for the designer, and it's just a, a great relationship for all of you. Yeah, absolutely. Win-win. Man, that's amazing, Tim. So you've been amazing. I mean, so for those listening, I mean, again, Tim, follow him, ton of energy. Hopefully get the chance to meet him someday. You'll, you, there's no way you can't be inspired. So for those listening, where can they find you? Uh, the best place to find us is going to be at Cabinet US, and that's Cabinet with a K. Uh, we're always releasing information about what's uh, happening and the latest and the greatest. And if anyone has any questions, they're looking for any advice, I'm usually available in DMs. I monitor that quite closely, although we do have a full um, full time intern on that, but I will definitely always look over. So feel free to chime in. Tim, you've been amazing. I can't thank you enough for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me, Brad. You're awesome. So thank you all for tuning into the podcast today. And just as a recap, if you check the show notes, they're just going to have all the links for the topics that we discuss. And also one of our favorite features now is the chapters that go through the conversation. So if there's certain topics you want to revisit or listen to, they're outlined by the time that we discuss those. And again, we can't thank you enough for all of your support. Please make sure and download our podcast, subscribe, give us a five-star rating and review wherever you download your podcast.